Okay, so what is the high-level summary of the programming model here? Well, you know, we have node entities that you annotate your POGOs with, and then they will be packed by a node in the graph. Um, the fields on the, on the nodes will sort of properties. If they are node entities themselves, the fields, we will use create relationships to, um, to describe that field between, between nodes. Um, you are still allowed, uh, I mean, you can work on your domain level and create a fully featured application and never drop down to the graph at all. Um, but if you need some high performance traversal, for example, um, then it's super simple to drop down one level, get access to the traversal API, and rock, rock and roll, and off you go. So that's the crash course in Spring Data Graph, the programming model. But now I want to do a really quick bonus section. Um, we're running a little bit late here, uh, so I'm going to speed it up. Uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit about cross store. And cross store is one of the most amazing things uh, I think about the Spring Data project. Um, and sort of to, to give you, um, um, uh, to paint a scenario for, for you, uh, let's um, say that we have an existing JPA app up and running. For example, I'm reusing the example that was shown uh, on stage at Spring 1 um, last year, uh, well, six months ago. Um, this one particular uh, app um, lists restaurants, and you manage favorite restaurants. Uh, so you have users, and you have restaurants, and, and you can mark them as favorites. The JPA model is very straightforward. Uh, this is pure JPA, the way I'm sure Everyone in this webinar has, has packed JPA. Um, and um, as you can see here, we have a couple of things, just normal normal properties, attributes. And then we have a many-to-many -many relationship between user accounts and restaurants. A user can have many favorite restaurants, and a restaurant can be favorited uh, by many users. But let's say that we wanted to add some you know, new and modern uh, and fancy features, such as um, we want our users to be friends with one another, um, which is a, a reasonable thing to do these days. Um, and we also want to be able to do recommendations based on the ratings of my friends. Um, turns out that this is really, really difficult to uh, implement in JPA. The SQL code for it is, is horrible. Um, and it's also really, really poor performance. It ends up in exactly the same kind of performance um, uh, whole that I used, uh, that I showed before with MySQL uh, in, in a couple of slides back. Um, so what you actually want to do here is you want to take the data that we just added now, which is all graphy, and put that in a graph database while, we, you know, uh, the rest of your application remains intact. This is called polyglot persistence. And I think this is going to be a, an increasingly important part of the average enterprise developer's life which is look at your existing data set, figure out parts of the data set that fits well in a relational database, see other parts that don't fit very well in a relational database, and then figure out uh, a more optimized storage for them. In this case, we have a lot of graphy data, so let's you know, put that where it shines, i.e. in a graph database. The problem with this, this sounds very simple in theory. The problem with this is that in any middleware out there on the planet, this is lead to incredibly poor um, and difficult to maintain code, except for Spring now with Spring Data. Um, and the sort of the, the application we had before were this. Do you remember? Now what we want to do is we want to add entities like recommendation and friends, uh, friends properties to user accounts that belong only to the graph. And the way that works, I'm going to walk you through right now. So what we've done, if you start in the upper left-hand corner into the restaurant, we've added a node entity. Um, we've then added a new uh, little attribute to the, to the annotation, which says partial equals true. And that instructs Spring Data Graph that you can, um, that parts of this risk elsewhere, in this case in, in, in JPA. Then the recommendation is actually stored only in the graph. This whole thing, that's a pure relationship entity. There's no JPA in there at all. And then on the user account, we said that that one is also partial. And the um, attributes at the bottom 
um, of the of the user account, um, as you can see, is very social. We have nicknames and we have friends and we have recommendations, and all of that are annotated to belong into the graph database. Um, and that is how simple it is to go into the world of polyglot persistence and add mixed storage to your domain. After this spring data graph, we'll look at it and we'll figure out that this, these guys over here, um, they belong to JPA. I'm not going to touch them. But over here, um, this is all uh, my stuff, and I'm going to take care of it, and I'm going to store it in the graph. Okay, um, so um, first step at a conclusion here. Spring Data Graph is a JPA-like um, library uh, that gives you awesome access to graph databases from Spring. Um, it has a tutorial type guidebook um, that uh, is, is pretty amazing. It's an 80-page book. Um, uh, the first half of it is a very easy to read tutorial, reads like a narrative. Um, it goes through a sample application called Cineast, um, which looks like this, very fancy, which um, shows all these movies and, and actors, and it includes real recommendations um, and social features, and the co source code for this is all open. Um, it's on GitHub. It runs on VMware's Pass Offering Cloud Foundry, um, and the tutorial, uh, the guidebook, as I mentioned, goes to exactly that. So that's definitely something that I'd urge you to check out if you want to get started uh, with this. You, you see the bit.ly link here at the <laughs> at the bottom uh, of the webcast, bit.ly slash cast book. <laughs> In order to fully conclude this session, before we move on to, to um, uh, Q&A, I just want to wrap up by reading a quote from uh, a guy who's one of the most astute observers of the NoSQL space and has written some of the best treatments that I've read on uh, massive scalability like the CAP theorem and really getting to scale this size. And he wrote this tweet a while back. Uh, he says, says, that seems to me that even after arguments about ACID and scale and CAP, it's just more human and more agile to be graph-based. I want to thank you all for attending this webinar and urge you to check out Spring Data Graph and to go out in the world and be more human and be more agile and be more graph-based. And with that, I want to move it to Adam for Q&A. Thank you, Emil. That was uh, great. We have a number of questions in right now, so uh, I'm going to start uh, asking you them. Uh, the first one is, I assume you can override the property relationship name for class fields. Is that correct? That is correct. If you can pass in parameters to the annotation and and provide um, uh, override the default, which is um, the name of the actual variable, and this is really important in particular for refactoring support. That is correct. Okay. Is it possible to model nodes and relationships in Java where the properties are not strong typed, i.e., using properties or map classes? Using prop, can you read the question again? Sure, uh, and we can ask uh, whoever asked the question to uh, possibly rephrase it. Is it possible to model nodes and relationships in Java where the properties are not strong type, i.e., using properties or math classes? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So no, currently you can't do that. Um, I assume I haven't written one myself, but I assume that you can run uh, write the spring conversion. Uh, to take that map and, and serialize it down to, to actual Neo4j properties. Um, and uh, I have one of the engineers of Spring Data Graph here beside me, and he's nodding solemnly. So uh, that, that seems to be um, um, an approach that you, that you can take. Okay, great. Uh, another question. Um, how concurrent modification will be handled if one thread is adding new recommendations and another thread is iterating through them? Yeah, that's um, that question comes down to to isolation semantics, and uh, it could easily take another 60-minute webinar. <laughs> um, I'm going to try to answer it briefly. Uh, there's lots of documentation about this on the Neo4j site, and there's always the Neo4j mailing list for it. Um, but the 
core isolation model for Neo4j is MVCC-like model, uh, not model, um, what is it, what is it, model, MVCC? Oh, sorry, yeah, multi-version concurrency control, um, which means that you can write to nodes at the same time as you traverse and read from them. But when you read from them, you're going to get the old value until that other transaction is committed. So the way it's going to work if you, if you traverse the graph is that if you hit the node that is being concurrently modified by a transaction, uh, if you hit it before that transaction has committed, you're going to get the old data. If you hit it after that transaction has been committed, you're going to get um, the new data. Um, so that's the, that's the default isolation level. You can modify it in particular by grabbing manual locks on various parts of the graph um, in order to get exactly the kind of semantics that you need to, you know, if you, if you want super strong bank account type isolation level, you can get that. Um, but that is the default isolation level, and it ends up being what most people want in 99% of the, of the cases. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question, uh, can a POJO, that's a plain old Java object, in case someone doesn't get the acronym, be an inheritance hierarchy? Yes. Okay. Um, another question, how far is the Grails integration for these concepts? So the Grails integration is, is maintained as a separate open source project. Um, I don't know the, the, uh, the latest status as of today, but what I do know is that it's successfully used in multiple commercial installations and it has an active maintainer. Um, so I, you know, I would assume that it's, it's pretty solid. Um, but of course, you know, ask on the mailing list for, for more details. Okay. Uh, another question. Uh, how do you share the Neo4j data file across multiple load balance servers? For that, you use Neo4j HA, which is high availability clustering support, uh, which was released in the, in the previous version of, of Neo4j. And it basically works um, so that you do not share the underlying store files. Um, but you install Neo4j on, say, three machines. Every machine has a separate set of store files but then they join the same cluster, and then at any point in time, they're going to have uh, the exact same view of the graph. Modulus, eventual consistency, if you want to have that. Um, but um, that's, that's how you get through my, uh, sorry, for Neo4j HA in clustering support. Okay. Uh, just a couple more questions. We're almost at the end of the webinar here. How is the inheritance hierarchy represented with nodes? Um, so that's an interesting question. Um, it's actually pluggable. Um, so we have a representation strategy um, that you can that you can plug in, um, and the, the default one is that we create type nodes for every for every type, um, and and then we use this indexing to to get between the instance and and its type. Okay, and then uh, coming up to the last question here, right? How do I get my own copy of Neo4j, and where do I go to find more details? So you go to neo4j.org, n-e-o-4j.org, and you download the whatever edition you want. Just hit the big download button, and you have it. Um, you can go to the Spring Data Neo 4 j page uh, to get a simple uh, five-minute introduction in how to get up and running from Spring, including Spring configuration and all those things. Great. And uh, if, if people have more questions about the Neo 4 j or, or Spring Data, then uh, where should they go to? Um, they should go to neo4j.org and, and subscribe to the mailing list, or they should go to the Spring Source forums, and there's a Spring Data section or sub-forum. Uh, that they can, where they can ask questions. Uh, they can also tweet with the Neo4j hashtag or Spring Data hashtag. We monitor that. Okay, thank you, Emil. Thank you, Mark. And I'd like to thank all of the audience for contributing your questions and staying with us to the very end. We appreciate your attention, and uh, we've had a great time on the webinar. Thank you for your attendance. Bye-bye.